Okay, this is the last video in the basic force field series, and that the video before this went on a little long, which I apologize for. I wanted to drive home a few points. I'll try not to make this one quite as lengthy, uh, but I want to wrap up the force field by considering... Uh, so we ended last time with this consideration of how strain is added to hypothetical zero values corresponding to all unstrained atom types. And I emphasize that if you did want to compare isomers having different atom types, you'd have to have some way of ranking those unstrained collections one relative to another. And I talked about Benson group equivalence as one way to do that. But now I'm actually going to make life uh, still a little more complicated and talk about situations where you might not uh, always be increasing energy relative to unstrained atom types, you might actually sometimes be decreasing energy. And uh, this can happen if we now consider interactions between non-bonded atoms. And what I mean by non-bonded in this case is not interacting through either a bond stretch, an angle bend, or a torsional coordinate. So an example of such an interaction could be a nonpolar interaction. And so let's think about that. Let's say we have two atomic types, and they are not defined to be bonded one to another, and so the force field will not compute any kind of bond stretching coordinate. And were those two atoms to be represented as hard spheres, then the energy as a function of distance between them, so this is our generic pair of atoms A and B, would be zero. It's just not something that's being computed as they get closer and closer and closer. And then at a certain distance, they kiss. One surface touches the other. And being hard spheres, the energy goes up to be infinity. So uh, that works quite well on a pool table, but is not particularly realistic from a chemistry standpoint. And instead, what we know happens in chemistry is that as the two atoms come closer and closer to one another, there is a weak attractive force between them. So a physical chemist would call that dispersion. Organic chemists sometimes talk about attractive van der Waals interactions. And you'll recall that the, the quantum mechanical reason for this interaction is induced dipole, induced dipole interactions, uh, which will uh, always be stabilizing. And that's a quantum mechanical phenomenon associated with electron-electron correlation. In addition, as they continue to get closer and closer together, they do eventually begin to interpenetrate their electron shells. And because of that interpenetration, you get something called exchange repulsion, as well as electrostatic repulsion, and that will cause the energy to go up, up, up. So it won't go up quite as steeply as infinitely sharply, but it does go up quite steeply. And so this sort of magenta curve is a more accurate representation of what happens in chemistry. And the way in which this is represented in many force fields is to use a so-called Leonard Jones potential. And for those who've heard this term uh, and wondered if Leonard worked with Jones, let me just point out this is a single last name. There was a single professor, Leonard Jones, who was an English faculty member. That looks like a you know, hyphenated last name, very English, very posh. And the form of the curve is as follows. The energy of interaction 4 times epsilon, and epsilon is some constant associated with A and B, and it's chosen to be the negative of the energy uh, value associated with the equilibrium distance. Sigma AB over RAB minus sigma AB over RAB uh, appears in this term. Here's a, a term that has a positive value so sigma is a positive constant associated with the two atoms A and B raised to the 12th power minus sigma over RAB to the 6th power. And so what you'll see is, uh, let's consider the various possibilities here. If R gets very, very large, then I will be dividing some number by a really big number, so I'll have a tiny little number. If I take a tiny little number to the 12th power, it goes to zero much faster than a tiny little number going to the 6th power. So this term will survive compared to this one, and it's negative, so I'll be below the asymptote of zero. On the other hand, as sigma passes to be a number that, sorry, as r passes to become a very small number, 
I'll take sigma divided by something smaller than itself. Now I've got a number bigger than 1, and a number bigger than 1 to the 6th power is less than a number bigger than 1 to the 12th power. So now this term will begin to dominate. And so you see you pass through 0 at the point where RAB is equal to sigma AB, right? Then I'd have 1 to the 12th minus 1 to the 6th, so that's 0. So now you can sort of see how all these constants relate to the shape of the curve. So you pick the sigma value based on where the attraction is exactly canceled by the repulsion, and you pick epsilon uh, based on the bottom of the well. And I've got a little asterisk here on R. This is not a constant here. This is actually the variable. You're looking at the distance between A and B, and you're plugging it into this equation. But you can determine what R star must be simply by solving for the minimum of this potential energy. And so if you do that, I'll leave the calculus to you. Uh, if you take the first derivative of this with respect to r, you ought to be able to set that equal to 0 and solve for the equilibrium point. You'll get rab star is equal to 2 to the 1 6th power times sigma ab. And so I encourage you to give that a try if you've got some pencil and paper in front of you. Uh, but I'll let you do that offline. Now, there's another kind of interaction between non-bonded atoms which is not nonpolar, but is in fact polar. That is, you could have an electrostatic interaction. And so if I have two atoms that carry charge, and maybe they're fully charged because they're really ions, but even if they're not, we certainly think of atoms uh, as carrying partial charges because that when they bond to one another with different electronegativities, there's some transfer of charge from less electronegative atoms to more electronegative atoms. And of course, any two atoms that have a like charge will repel one another. And so zero is what happens at infinite distance because Coulomb's law is that the energy is equal to product of the charges divided by distance. So if distance is infinity, there's no interaction. And as I bring things closer and closer together, if they're the same charge, the energy will go up. And if they're opposite charge, the energy will go down. And the potential says that they go up or down as one over R. These are the charges on the atoms, and epsilon is the dielectric constant of the medium. And that, for a force field, that is something you have to pick. You determine what dielectric constant you might like to use. Now, you might expect, well, you ought to use one, right? That's the dielectric of a vacuum, and we're thinking of an isolated molecule. However, that might not be your best choice, because with a value of one, you will have sort of the strongest possible electrostatic interactions. And you will be very sensitive to the charges that you put on your atoms. You might find it more convenient to have an epsilon value somewhat larger than one, and many force fields do. And moreover, you may be imagining a medium in which molecules are existing or interacting that is a condensed phase, perhaps with its own dielectric constant, and there might be virtue in using that higher dielectric constant. This is just something that would have to be uh, played with during parameterization. We will certainly talk about so-called continuum solvent models much later in the course, but for now, let's just emphasize that epsilon is typically a parameter in a force field, not necessarily a physical constant. And so what you see is, in terms of new parameters in the force field, we've introduced by atom type, Q. So what is the partial charge, say, of an oxygen atom in a ketone? So if I have an atom type sp2 oxygen, I will need to assign a uh, partial charge to it if I want to compute this term in my force field. And I've already made this point to you, the dielectric constant uh, is a atomic pair parameter. It's not usually taken as one. Some force fields used to, in fact, take it as dependent on the distance. That's relatively rare now, but uh, it certainly has been explored. Now, that was a, a Coulomb's law-like interaction, an interaction between point charges. You don't have to use that formulation. Some force fields actually, rather than assigning charges to the atoms, assign dipole moments to individual bonds. And so if you look up uh, in your favorite physics textbook, what is the energy of interaction between two dipoles? Here's the correct form for a dipole-dipole interaction. So the dipole associated with bond AB interacting with the dipole associated with bond CD. And so it depends on the distance between the midpoints of those dipoles. So that's this R, A, B, C, D that appears here to the third power in the denominator. 
the product of the magnitudes of the dipoles, so each bond has a dipole, here's the AB dipole, here's CD, and then because they're vectors, even though you know the distance between them, you need to specify some additional things, and in particular, you need to specify the cosine of uh, an angle between them, and it is the angle of the, uh, that's shown here, this angle chi, and also a term depending on the cosine of how the vectors are rotated relative to the uh, line that joins their two uh, midpoints. So I, I don't want to dwell too much on what's sort of a, a freshman physics problem, but in any case, this is the well-defined energy of interaction between two dipoles. And you could certainly compute this as part of your force field if you chose to use this expression. Another non-bonded potential, not, not necessarily relevant to this picture, but I'll just mention it as we're wrapping up talking about non-bonded interactions. Some force fields recognize hydrogen bonding as a unique additional term. So that is a hydrogen attached to an electronegative element interacting with a electronegative element, a Lewis base, if you will. And one form for that might be, instead of a Leonard-Jones potential, which is a sometimes called a 612 potential, uh, some force fields will use a 10-12 potential, so it's attractive to the 10th power and repulsive to the 12th power. And again, you'd have some new parameters. You'd have to pick this A prime and B prime values that you would parameterize on experimental data, presumably. So the dipole-dipole potential, the parameters that would come in would be the magnitudes of the dipoles for individual bonds and possibly the dielectric constant that you choose to use. And then I'm, I'm going to mention one thing just as a a brief bit of historical context. Let me go back a slide here. Uh, two slides, I guess. So I like to bring a little history into the lectures uh, just to give you a feel for how computational chemistry was born. It, it turns out that uh, most people are pretty aware while the sixth power of attractive uh, interaction is, is pretty well established for dispersion interactions, in fact the repulsive interaction is better represented as a tenth power not the twelfth power. And so uh, that was, that's been known for a long time. However, uh, the original motivation to use a twelfth power was purely computational in nature. If you've got something to the sixth power, it is a single floating point operation to multiply it times itself and get the value to the twelfth power. Whereas you have to do potentially more math in order to get from 6th to 10th power, more floating point operations. So it's just faster to compute the 12th power than it is to do the 6th. Nowadays, of course, that is such a tiny fraction of uh, time that some force fields do not use 12 6 They may indeed use 10 6 They might use exponential forms. There's a lot of forms out there for non-bonded interactions. But I think it's worthwhile to... Uh, just to note that the simplicity of this expression, it's not just simple in a physical way, it's also simple in a computational way, and that's often a consideration when one is designing new models that are uh, very demanding for the computational resources at hand. Happily, computers keep getting faster, 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 and as a result, computational chemists who are developing algorithms can do more and more sophisticated things. Okay, so uh, back to the sort of final force field. So now that we've talked about all these non-bonded interactions, what, how, how might they play in? So let me come back again to cycloheptane and heptene. After computing the strain energy associated with bonded linkages, uh, so that was the stretching strain, angle bending strain, torsion strain, next we could think about the non-bonded interactions, and it could be that all these different methylene groups that are not interacting with one another one way or in, in one of these fashions would have attractive van der Waals uh, uh, attra attractive van der Waals attractions. Yeah, that's sort of tautological, isn't it? Uh, there are attractive forces between the different groups that would lower the overall energy. So this is not, this is not a positive strain-like value. This is, in fact, a favorable non-bonded interaction. And on the other hand, perhaps in uh, the heptene case, there might be a positive non-bonded interaction. And that would adjust the positions of these levels again. Of course, we still can't make a direct comparison between them unless first we set the unstrained atom types to a common zero. But uh, the take-home message on the slide is that total molecular mechanics energy is a combination of strain energy and non-bonded energy. And the latter may be either net positive or negative. Okay, so uh, let's wrap up 
the discussion of force fields and molecular mechanics by thinking about finding stationary points. So this is a point I made early on. How do I find minima, for example? Because the energies of arbitrary structures are much less interesting than the energies of stationary points, optimum structures, if you will. Uh, your drawing is usually not all that good. You, you can't just lay down a molecule with all its best bond distances, angles, and so forth. You would like the computer to find the minimum on the potential energy surface. Well, what is that minimum? It is a stationary point. It is defined from a calculus standpoint by the first derivative of the energy with respect to motion along any coordinate, and so that's the negative of the force along that coordinate in physics, has to be equal to zero. There are no forces on any of the atoms. And because we've built our force field out of simple analytic equations, it ought to be extremely straightforward to simply take the first derivative of the energy as a function of all the coordinates. And we compute the first derivatives and, and see if they're zero or not. If they're not zero, we will get the forces. We can move the atoms along the directions the forces indicate in order to lower the energy and just keep doing that, taking step after step to reduce the forces on the atoms and uh, bring them down to zero and find a minimum. So how one goes about doing that, there are many applied mathematical algorithms and the textbook mentions a few of them and I, I'm not going to dwell on them in a video lecture. Uh, but ways from applied mathematics, if you will, to find the minimum in a function of arbitrarily high dimensionality, that is, number of variables. And in order to do it, you certainly do need first derivatives. Uh, you may be able to take advantage of higher derivatives. We can always take second derivatives and third derivatives. And that, just as a Taylor expansion, the more you expand it out, the more knowledge you have of the function further from the reference point, so too your ability to move on the potential energy surface is facilitated by higher derivatives, but that comes at the cost of actually computing them. That process is called geometry optimization, the process of uh, zeroing the forces on the atoms. Now, in terms of validating a force field, what makes a force field good or bad? So how do I go about doing it? Well, first I get a big body of experimental data. And typically the data I'll have are structural and they're energetic. I define an error function that balances, in my mind, I'm the person doing the development, what's tolerable for an error in a bond length compared to, say, isomer energetics. That is, how willing am I to accept maybe a hundredth of an angstrom error in bond lengths compared to how willing I am to accept a kcal per mole error in energy for chair form of cyclohexane compared to boat form of cyclohexane. So there's two forms of cyclohexane that are presumably the same atom types, and I can directly compare their energies. And I'll assign penalties, essentially, to my parameters that will not let them wander too far from uh, you know, best values based on how much I care about one thing compared to another thing. And now I'll vary all my parameters, and maybe I'll vary the functional forms that I'm using for bond stretching, for angle bending, whatever, in order to minimize my error function. So the error function is, you know, the, the numerical expression of how much I care about, say, bond links compared to bond angles, compared to torsion angles, compared to isomer energetics, etc. When I am satisfied, when I have tried all the different variations I might imagine, I start from different starting sets of parameters and move them around, hopefully they all end up in a similar space, when I feel like I have a physical set of parameters and functional forms for my validation data, I lock them all into that stone tablet I keep mentioning, chisel them down, put a name at the top of the tablet, maybe it's MM3, that was, that's an existing force field, an organic force field, give it to the whole world, publish it, become famous, and here's an important thing with five exclamation points, try to keep it stable. One of the, one of the most annoying things in computational chemistry is that occasionally someone will make changes to a model, maybe it's a force field model, and fail to note in the name or in the distribution or in the code in which that model is employed that those changes have been made. And so you go and do a calculation with one code and you get a certain answer. And you go and do what you think is the exact same calculation in a different code and you get a different answer. 
and now you don't know which one is right. Maybe neither is right. Maybe they've both been changed relative to an original. But that defeats reproducibility, which is a grave scientific sin. And so we do want to be very careful about that. And I'll also try to be a little careful about uh, terminology here. I want to emphasize that when you do a calculation, you do not report a calculation based on the program you used. It's certainly appropriate to report the program as part of methods, but you wouldn't say, oh, the energy of cyclohexane with PC model, that's a program we're going to use, is 5.4 kcals per mole. That means nothing. That's just a program, and the program may have many different methods in it. A method might be MM3. It might be... Uh, Actually, method is probably even bad here. I'll say model. So a method is molecular mechanics. A particular model in molecular mechanics is MM3 or MM2 or MMX. Uh, they, they do all seem to have MMs in them, don't they? But uh, in any case, being very careful to distinguish between methods, molecular mechanics is a method, models, a model is all of the functional forms and parameters needed in order to do the calculation within the context of a method. And finally, program. So the program is where it's coded. So it's worth reporting the program because then if you do discover that you've got different answers than somebody else, you can wonder who screwed up their program. But uh, stability, reproducibility, really, really critical. And finally, one of the things I want to emphasize is uh, chemical intuition should not be discounted in, in the context of force field validation. Uh, just looking for the best parameters you possibly can find by minimizing an error function and figuring that when you get your error function down to its minimum, you're done, it's, it's perfect. Uh, it's really good to think like a chemist, to look at the parameters, to sniff them, evaluate their smell, make sure there's not one molecule that is an enormous outlier, uh, but because there's so many other molecules, it, its influence was outweighed. Uh, yeah, really, a careful chemist going through the data is worthwhile, and that's just a, I guess that's a sermon on my part. So the, the last food for thought I want to give you is, uh, now let's turn it around. Let's say you are eager and ready to, do, to go do a molecular mechanics calculation. What should you do? Well, you've got to pick a force field. And so how, how do I pick a force field is, is a typical question. Well, the best thing to do is look at the molecule or molecules that you're interested in and determine as best you can which force fields used molecules that look a lot like yours in their training sets, the parameterization sets that were used to develop the force field. So if you already look a lot like those molecules and the force field was optimized for those molecules, you're in good shape. So if you're going to do a protein, for example, it behooves you to pick a force field that perhaps was not designed for generic organic molecules but really was optimized for proteins. And bearing in mind, uh, the simple force fields, the harmonic force fields, necessarily do better near minima than they do far away from minima because the parabolas stop looking very reasonable as you get far away from minima. So if you have really highly strained molecules, you might imagine you'd like more sophisticated force fields. Keep in mind that once you define a bond, it cannot be broken in a harmonic force field, and neither can you form a new one. And so force fields are bad for reactions in general. There are such things as reactive force fields, and we may have a chance to chat about that at some point, but usually uh, the bond is what the bond is. So they're good for structures, and they're good for energies that are near equilibrium points. If you start with a bad guess structure, there is no guarantee the minimum that your... Uh, that your program will take you into using its own geometry optimization criteria is a meaningful one. That is, you may have just made a mistake in drawing, essentially. You might have inverted a carbon atom. So you've got all four things on an sp3 carbon on one side of that carbon. Well, it turns out that the functional forms used in most force fields consider it uphill to try to move one of those substituents over to its proper position tetrahedrally. So instead, you'll minimize to a weird square pyramidal methane. Of course, it's thousands of kcals higher in energy than the tetrahedral one, but it is a minimum on the potential energy surface given those functional forms. So again, uh, chemist's intuition and evaluating the structures that you get out from a program, really quite critical. Uh, try to be sure you're starting from something rational.
And, of course, uh, should any of these prove problematic for you, you can always develop a new force field, and uh, we may, again, have a chance to chat a bit about what's going on in, in modern force field development. So I want to finish by giving you a sort of an example of where is molecular mechanics modeling potentially very useful. And so here is a, a plot, and you see sucrose, actually. So sucrose is common table sugar. And the structure for sucrose is shown here in the upper right. So sucrose is a, a glucose and a ribose uh, fragment bonded together at this uh, joining oxygen atom. And you can define the geometry, at least part of the geometry of sucrose, as a rotation about this CO bond and a rotation about this CO bond, phi and psi. And so this contour map is showing you the relative energies of sucrose molecules as a function of phi and psi in kcals per mole. And so you see the contour intervals are labeled here 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 15, 20. These are kcals per mole. And so up here, apparently, we're on some very high plateau, very, very high energy. You don't even show the contour lines anymore. It gets ugly. But there's a low energy region right here. This is where the somewhere in here is the zero, presumably. And then there's a little valley here that drip, dips a little below 6, and it looks like there's another little valley somewhere in here. And this map was generated. These are only two coordinates. So remember, at the very beginning of talking about potential energy surfaces and slices, we talked about what would you do with all the other coordinates when you take a slice. So this map was generated by considering all possible orientations of hydroxyl groups and hydroxymethyl groups using molecular mechanics. And so if you think about how you might go about, and, and the lowest energy point was used, so the relaxed rotation, if you will, was used to put a point down on this surface, and then finally all the points were contoured up. So if you think about a hydroxyl group and ask where would the minima be expected to be, well, probably you're going to need to survey three possible orientations, right? You could survey under the ring, that would be gauche between these two substituents. You could survey pointing out this way, that would be gauche between the CC bond and this CH. Or you could be pointing back that way, gauche between this CC bond and this CH. So that's three possible rotomers for this group. And there are one, two, three, four, the CC bond five, six, the CC bond seven, eight, nine, ten, 11, the CC bond. There are 11 bonds, every one of which can have any of three different torsions. So there are three to the 11th energies uh, that are possible here. And I'm not sure why I'm cutting off my last point here, but it says per point on the, uh, on the surface. So that's, that's a lot of calculations, 3 to the 11th. I'll let you plug that into your calculator that maybe you carry in your back pocket or in your uh, smartphone. But Lots and lots and lots of calculations. Not easy to do with quantum mechanics. You want a super fast method to generate that. And when you're all done by, and you survey all those possibilities, you can create this contour map. So the next question is, OK, it's pretty, but how good is it? So you might have been wondering, what are those black triangles? So the black triangles come from crystal structures of sucrose bound into proteins. Uh, proteins that bind it and don't necessarily react with it, so you can still see the sucrose. And they represent the phi psi values that are found in those crystal structures. So presumably, biology is designed to recognize sucrose not at a very high energy conformation, because that would be a bit silly, instead to recognize it as it's floating around in your body because you want to do something with it, sequester it, carry it somewhere else. And what one finds is that, indeed, most of these triangles fall in a pretty tight shot pattern. It, uh, it turns out this one that's at very high energy is actually a sulfonated sucrose, and it's probably interacting with a... So a sulfonate is a negative group in, in aqueous solution, and it's interacting with a positive lysine cation in the protein. But most of these fall in a pretty tight shot pattern near this minimum. Not quite in it, but close, so all within about mm, 5 kcals per mole. Interestingly, there is one crystal structure that's got a sucrose with a substantially more negative C value, even though it's got about the right phi value. And the molecular mechanics does predict that there's kind of a shallow shelf here that is not too high in energy. So this uh, suggests that the force field is doing a pretty decent job because it's predicting minimum energy
uh, regions at the potential energy surface where experiment is indeed generating a lot of structures. And if you uh, would like to have a little foreshadowing for later in the course, turns out what's missing in the force field is something called the anomeric effect, uh, a very favorite stereoelectronic effect of organic chemists. It has to do with hyperconjugation that stabilizes certain torsions about an OCOC linkage. So that's what phi and C are, right? They're OCOC torsions. So when a lone pair on oxygen is anti-periplanar to a carbon-oxygen bond, there is a favorable hyperconjugation as that lone pair delocalizes into the acceptor sigma star orbital with which it has very good overlap. And that lowers the energy. So unless you have that term explicitly included in your force field, you, of course, won't pick that up. Uh, hybrid quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics calculations, which we will talk about later in the course, actually illustrated that and moved this contour up so that it really encompasses these. So that's a, a feature of sort of physics, if you will. If you don't have the physics in your force field, that's an error that you're going to introduce. Okay, well, we have had a, a lot of lecture on molecular mechanics. Uh, I'm going to finish with a, a little quiz question for you to think about before we discuss this in class. And that is, to what substance does one typically add sucrose? And sure enough, uh, now is your chance to go and relax and have a cup of coffee or tea or hot chocolate or, you know, you tell me what your favorite libation is and uh, you're welcome to it. But we will uh, discuss the force field in, in more depth in class and look at a few practical exercises. And I look forward to seeing you then.